Welcome back to How Soccer Explains Leadership. Thank you so much for your download. Thanks for being a part of this show that I absolutely love getting to do what I get to do. And I know that Paul Jobson is always grateful uh, for the conversations that I'm able to have with our guests that we get to talk about every few episodes. Today, we have a great guest, David Rika, with us, and he's got an amazing resume that we're going get to get to talk about today. But before we do, I just want to remind you to uh, reach out to us. We'd love to have, continue the conversation with you um, beyond you just listening. It's, it's great that you're getting the great information from these people. But what makes it even better is when you're able to uh, converse with me and Paul about what you're learning and how we can help you. We have the Coaching the Bigger Game program at coachingthebiggergame.com. Paul and Marcy Jobson have the Warrior Way program that they're doing down there in Waco, Texas as well. And I know they'd love to talk with you about that, jobsonsoccer.com. You can also uh, just send me an email if you have any thoughts, if you have any things that you would like to discuss with me. Um, you can do that at, uh, at my, my email address as well as the, the Facebook group. So without more from me, David, how are you doing today? Good. How are you doing, Phil? It's good to, good to see you. Good to hear from you. And just thank you again. I'm honored to be here. Uh, I really am. And I've been waiting for this day. Thanks. Well, good. Well, I'm honored to have you on the show. And I know we, we actually connected doing the, uh, soccer resilience mental health summit, couple of weeks ago it's probably a month ago at this point um and you know i just got to hear your story and i immediately said i'm i'd love to get you on the show have a conversation more than that i want to just get to know you and hang out we've been able to do that a little bit uh via the zoom uh world so um but uh you know that's something you're also an ambassador for soccer resilience i know that's something that you're doing but there's a whole lot more can you just share it with our audience a bit about your background how you got to be where you are today how you got to be passionate about soccer and leadership and mental health yeah absolutely um it, it's, it's a couple of things couple several things um whatever you want to call it I, I grew up in a family, Argentinian. Uh, all my parents are, all my cousins and family are from Argentina. Came to New York City about 50 years ago. Uh, I was born in New Jersey, New Brunswick. And my mother's side had 17 brothers and sisters. So we're talking a big family. Mm -hmm. My brother, my dad had about four siblings. So uh, my whole life was around the Argentinian culture. Uh, obviously when I went to school, it was, uh, different culture but soccer it's, it's just always been it's it, it just always been a you know I, I, I think I was born with soccer just learning about it all my uncles played my dad played and you know they played in Flushing Queens when I was a kid I remember going there the big globe and just killing each other on those grounds and I, <laughs> yeah, just like no grass or anything I just remember the whole thing it was a, it was a weekend thing and they would have asados, you know, the Argentinian barbecue. And yeah. uh, that, that's how I came in. And I played soccer my whole life since I was four. Um, ended up getting hurt around uh, the year to 2001, uh, which I'll share. It was, it was a big month that month. And um, worked at Morgan Stanley Smith Barney as in the Latin American Wealth Management Division because I speak fluent in Spanish. So it's helped, helped me to um, reach out to Latin American companies or individuals to help them with their uh, financial goals. And I did that for Morgan Stanley for about six years. And I've always been in soccer, always been part of a group where as a consultant, where we, we did all the international games that came to the States, like Brazil, uh, Mexico, all those teams that were coming at one point for friendlies, we were in charge of all that and logistics. And that's when I really knew soccer uh, that that instead of playing or coaching that there's literally like a business behind all this mm -hmm. you know all this soccer youth from adults from professional it's a business behind there and i really wanted to learn so much and i volunteered with these guys and just learned and learned and learn and um you know just to, to to stop there but then i started just live soccer uh and there's so much that went into it and just um working at CBS and all this, like, you know, working at Morgan Stanley, CBS, a big, a huge uh, companies. And I was always out there uh, outreaching and talking to individuals. So I said, why don't I do this with soccer? But I said, uh, and I'm a 9-11 survivor, which we'll get into this. Um, 
in 2001. So I started Just Love Soccer because I wanted to give back somehow. So I didn't know how to give back with Just, just Live Soccer. So what I did is I formed tournaments and most of the proceeds went to a soccer um, charity. So that's how I brought the charity and the giving back, utilizing soccer. So um, that's a little bit about me. Um, you know, we can get into 9-11. I don't, you know, I just uh, want to, you know, see what you think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, for sure. That, that's good. That's a good start. It's funny. Uh -huh. I, I actually worked for a law firm back in 2002 where my main client was Smith Barney. So it was oh, okay. represented uh -huh. and Jack Grubman and the world Com stock options and all that, all that good stuff. So that was back in the day, kind of brought back some, some memories that, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, talk about trauma there's there might be some there for me but I'm not I'm not gonna <laughs> lie uh but uh but no I, I, you actually got to work with the world cup in 2010 as well you've been as you said the kind of the business side of soccer doing media doing different things there which is which is you know obviously pretty cool anything anything having to do with the the world cup is is great but I know one of the things, and and we and you talked about this a bit with the uh, with the mental health summit. But you talked about being a nine eleven survivor. I do you want I do want you to go into that, well, and I, I really want you to talk. Um, you know, this is actually where my my two worlds collide: being part of the orphan care and the orphan and vulnerable children around the world, and the, so much of it is trauma informed care. And what I talk with a lot of people is, soccer is one of the most uh, I mean, it's probably the most spoken language in the world, right? But it's also a tool we can use in the context of trauma and in the context of helping people overcome and helping people to be able to um, really uh, continue to live with with this these these issues that we have. So, can you speak to that as far as yeah. you know the story first of all, and then how you have used soccer and how you use this game that we love to be able to help you work through a lot of these things that uh, come with a traumatic event like that. So totally. Um, so yes, I was picked to go to the uh, 2010 South African uh, the World Cup. Uh, in, I worked in Cape Town. I was there for two months, part of the marketing and media department. I basically uh, just said a prayer and I said, all right, here's the application. Thousands and thousands of applications uh, were there. Um, and I, I told them my story of the 9-11, why I want to do this. And this is going to, I ended up going there by myself on a, on a journey that uh, would change my life pretty much. And I, I didn't know about orphanages. I didn't know about kids being homeless. And I, I, you know, I grew up in Patterson, but I never saw Patterson, New Jersey, which is, you know, an urban area. And I never saw kids being homeless. And, and, and I saw that in South Africa and right there, a little, um, little alarm in my brain said, well, you have to, you know, you got to try to do something. I can't believe there's kids sleeping literally on the streets and asking for a couple of dollars. And I had soccer balls at the, at the world cup that I bought from here, like a whole bunch. And, and you know, I, I gave them a few bucks. But then man, when I gave them that soccer ball, they put it on and they started playing. And just to see their faces on these kids, I said, all right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give back utilizing the game of soccer for anyone or anyone in the world, but mostly for that, that, that group that really has issues. And once they step on the field, you know, those issues might be gone for a little bit, but at least we gave them the opportunity to play and forget about what's going on at home, forget about what the, the economy and everything. So that's where 2010 just live soccer started after it started during that, when I was on my way to the world cup there. Um, and how I utilize it from now, from then till now is just partnering up with groups like Soccer Resilience, um, which are doing the exact uh, helping mental group. Um, and that's where I'm at. And I'll tell you the 9-11. And then just just bear with me. I, I, I Sometimes I go off the radar. I speak from my heart. So it goes on. Oh, I, I love yeah. it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So um that's how Just Live Soccer happened, just to help people some way in soccer, how it, how it helped me. So how it helped me. Um, it, it kept me out of trouble when I was a kid. It, it, it taught me so many things about life. My, my family, we always spoke about soccer at a dinner table, whatever. It just taught me so much teamwork. 
everything that really, really is, is, is the soccer component when you're on that field and off the field. And when I worked for Morgan Stanley, 2001, I started there in 2000 after um, my soccer career was kind of over. I played a lot of semi-pro teams and, and back then there wasn't like uh, UPSL and so many opportunities for us. So we would go from team to team and collect a few dollars there and get practicing gas money. But that's the way it was, you know, and I, ha- I, was, I was loving, loving life. And, and I also worked at Morgan Stanley. I didn't know anything about stocks and bonds or any of that at all. Um, my parents didn't know either. So I wasn't taught that. So I was at a bar mitzvah one time and somebody um, that I know for a while that I'd seen him at a couple of bar mitzvah, his name is Greg Amira. Um, his name will, will um, come up later on during this. He said, hey, um, you know, cause I was working for a small firm but I didn't know anything about it. I wasn't taught anything. So he said, hey, why don't you come and work at Morgan Stanley in the 73rd floor? I said, wow, really? So long story short, he, he was a vice president there, but I still had to go through all the protocols. And we went to seven interviews uh, to get into their mm-hmm. comprehensive training program. It was three months, three months of not doing anything, but just learning, learning, learning. Uh, and they had this training facility on the 68th floor. It was just, it looked like a trading floor in the New York Stock Exchange, just yeah. bizarre. And from like 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., Monday through Friday. So that's where I became a financial advisor uh, to, to the wealth management division. And I, I was the first one always there, first one there, last one to leave type attitude, uh, reading as much as I can, learning from um, other vice president there and just not being shy and going to them, hey, can, I'm new at this. So September 11th, 2001 was just like any other day. I got there quarter to seven or something like that. It would always be early. Um, I always share the, my breakfast that I, that I, that I, I, I got that early morning is because um, you, I used to have to take two elevators to the 73rd floor. It will be the first one. It stops at 44th floor. From there you switch, you go to the 73rd. But on the 44th floor, there is a cafeteria, a beautiful cafeteria for Morgan Stanley employees. There was a guy named John that uh, was there every single day. And, and so early in the morning, um, just an amazing, amazing human being. Just happy. To, you know, I was just so happy to see him when I go up to work. It just gave me that little push. Um, so I got my egg whites, four egg whites, scooped in a bagel, got tomatoes. I know it's exact. And I went upstairs and started to have conversations with my colleagues and you know whatever time it was um i was in tower two the lights flickered on and off like really quickly so i looked to my to to, to my buddy who had a cubicle to my to, to, uh, to my right and i said what was that and he's like uh that's eh, probably an air conditioning or something to do with the with the hvac or something like that so we didn't play any pay any mind to it so we had um, a person facing, uh, had an office facing tower one. He comes out screaming the loudest scream I've ever heard. He saved my life. Um, I wish I could see him one day and thank him. I don't know his name. I, I forgot cause I wasn't there that long, but he was a very, very, um, um, you know, he's been there for a long time. So he comes out, everybody screaming, everybody get out, get out. So I'm like, I literally got up really quickly because of the fear in his eyes. So I'm like, wow, I, I got to get up. So I looked to my right where his office was open so I could see the other building. I just saw a whole bunch of papers, like a ticket tick parade. It just looked crazy. So we went to the staircase. We're walking down the staircase, 73, 72, and it's two by two. So very slowly, and there's people coming out of each floor. There's numbers, big numbers on each floor. So I can see how what fl- what uh, floor I'm on. I was, and then we all thought it was an accident. Back then, there were so many mm-hmm. planes that would be chartered. Um, and Phil, I'll tell you, we just thought it was an accident. People were joking around. Uh, hey, we're going to get back upstairs and listen to the earnings for whatever stock it was back then. And yeah, that it. I was somewhere in the 30s, man. And um, that's when the second plane hit, and that's mm-hmm. when changed my life, man. It, I fell to the ground. It's the hardest, hardest hit. Like, you know, I don't know what it is to get hit by a NFL uh, player or linebacker, but it was just felt so hard, you know, something to that point where 
that something that hit us so hard can literally sweep me off my feet and fall to the ground, like literally on my shoulder, um, which killed me. And we're all on the ground. I don't know how many long, a minute or two, and then the sprinklers are going off, the lights are turning on and off, huge mayhem. Um, the, the building's literally crackling, making a crackling sound like a, like a, a branch. And it's, I'm literally looking at the walls and the walls are literally moving and making that crackling sound. Literally these walls were moving. And I said, oh my, this thing is gonna tip over. But not the way I'm saying it now, like with, with tears and just the screaming. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we, we uh, I was with this woman who hurt her ankle. Um, never saw her again in my life, but I, I put like, you know, I put her arm on my shoulders and we walked down together because she couldn't walk. So she was kind of leaning on me and uh, her and I, and we had some friends there as well. And um, we walked step by step and we made it out. And as soon as I got to the bottom, that's where the mall was at that time. And then there was a plaza between the first tower and the two tower with the spear where you go out there, get lunch. And I've been there probably every day in the spring or summer. And right there is when I saw the horrific things, parts of things that, you know, it's just so graphic to, to say, um, parts of planes, little fires all over the place. They look like little, like somebody, like a little fire pits all over the place in the huge, huge plaza. And I look, I'm like, wow, what just happened here? So literally I run in the, and inside the mall, because at this time there was room, and I started hearing these loud noises, bang, I mean, it, 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 it's uncomprehensive of how loud this noise was. And they already set something up, the cops, um, the cops, firemen, uh, control uh, station inside somewhere there. And I said, what is that noise? And, and he looks at me kind of weird. And he literally told me those were people jumping. That That's what the mm. noise was. And, and that loud noise, the loud noise of the, the plane hitting, it was just absolutely I just can't it, it, it can't put it into words what that noise so we finally get out we're across the street I meet my friend Brad who was like your buddy my buddy at work like you know you have a best friend yeah. at work you can count on he was he was my best friend there and he looks at me he's a real tall guy and he's like man I think we just got terrorized or bombed or whatever that, that quick sentence or whatever it was, as soon as he finished his sentence, my tower started coming down. We're right there. We're right across the street. And all we hear, and my tower is coming down. And for a split second, we just started booking, running. Mm -hmm. and we jumped into a store. I don't remember what the store was to this day, a jewelry store, it was something. And we jumped in and they closed the doors and, and we just see like the that cloud of the debris just go right past us. And we still got some on, you know, some, some dust and all that on, on our clothes and everything. And it was just so crazy. Like we, we start, then we got out of there. Finally, when things settled down a little bit, when we could finally walk, we were walking towards the Brooklyn bridge. And I'll tell you, Phil, I was going to jump into the East river because I thought they were going to bomb the Brooklyn bridge. Mm -hmm. I was like shaking, like, what do I do? It was like a die hard movie. There was cops, I'd never seen an FBI Jackie, you know, the ones you see in the movie with yeah. FBI. Never seen those in real life, you know, and I, they were all over the place, black SUVs, everything. It was just, it was, it was just un unbelievable. They came out of the woodworks out of nowhere. Um, so I was going to jump in, in in the East River and then my, my friend Brad, no, don't do it. Let's just go all the way to the East side. And he had an apartment on 40th and First Avenue. So we walked the whole time uh, to his apartment it, and we didn't even say much words to each other and people were around cars listening to radios tvs uh, of windows of, of bodegas and while this is all happening i'm trying to get a phone to call my mom and my dad and my stepdad and my dad and family in new jersey but the, the phones weren't working to call out mm. so i could not call them and say hey i'm okay for now and i didn't get in touch with them until like about 8 30 at night wow. when i found um 
my friend Brad and, and his wife now, they, they found, because I wanted to go home. I could stay there if I wanted to, but I wanted to get home because it's yeah. you know, like my family. And then, just, you know, they, they think it's, it's, you know, not a good, not a good um, outcome is going to come out of this, yeah. you know, for me. So I, I found um, a train from um, Penn Station, one train, the last one to go into Bluefield, New Jersey. My family lived in Clifton. So that's when I actually called them. I went in there with the debris. The people were so nice. They were helping me put water in my eyes and all that stuff um, in, inside the train. And um, there, was a, there was a phone there uh, and I called Collect. And my brother answered the phone. He goes, man, Dave, your voice never sounded so beautiful, mm. man. My brother's just a hard dude. And for him to say that, mm. I said, just tell mom, tell dad that I'm okay. I'm actually in Bloomfield. Can you guys pick me up? And they were all there. And, you know, they, that's how they found out that I was okay. And, um, you know, that's just the beginning of, of a disaster waiting, waiting to come with the PTSD and everything. So yeah, that's the story when 9-11. And then after that, there's another one with the PTSD, but I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I would just like to continue Sure, it's no problem. With yeah. that PTSD conversation, as much as you want to share. Yeah, yeah. And and then weave in, you know, obviously with the with the show, we really want to help people understand how you know you've used the game, but also just other tools that you were able to use because you know, this podcast isn't just about soccer, right? This is sure, about yeah. leading people, and we're gonna have people who've gone through traumatic experiences new from hard places in different ways and so i just love to help people to give them tools to be able to help them to help those who they're being able to to impact in their lives absolutely and and that's why i was honored phil when you asked me to come on this because you know you're you're doing something about it and i truly truly appreciate you as a person your 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 uh, podcast and you know you're really touching a lot of people so um um, I'm blessed that I'm here with you. So I just wanted to say that. I and it. yeah, I'll tell you, um, you know, what happens with the big companies or whatever finance is very important. Obviously people's money, it was, it was there. So I had to go to work. It happened that Tuesday. I had to go to work on Thursday. That oh my Thursday. Gosh. If not, I would have lost my job. <laughs> um, due to the reason is there was no more room and that that was my career. So I went Thursday we were on the 22nd floor of two Penn Plaza, which is right on top of Madison Square Garden. So mm -hmm. I'm still on the 22nd floor, still freaking out, noises. I drove into the city from New, from New Jersey. It was just really bad. Uh, the PTSD um, hit me hard. I couldn't sleep, sweating. I still sweat every day, um, but just loud noises, afraid of people thinking they're going to bomb us again any second or just something bad was going to happen every single day. And I suffered like that. And then it's just a lot more. Um, um, I, I didn't, you know, we had a therapy. Morgan Stanley provided a lot of therapy. I didn't do it a lot in the beginning. Um, you know, we had, I had a lot of friends, close friends, you know, close knit that they really, it, it hit them hard too. They thought they lost their buddy, you know, that we grew up together. We had a, a nice we still do. And the PTSD from 2001 to 2006, um, nobody knew who, who I was. I completely just changed as a human being in, in that minute being in, in that building. Um, I was not funny anymore or goofy. Um, uh, I stopped playing soccer. We were going out and just doing uh, the drinking and just everything to forget about why I'm dealing with this. But you know, you, you, you go out drinking or you do other stuff, it, it's going to be right there anyway. So that, that didn't work. Um, I played, uh, I was playing in a semi-pro league the same September of 2001. The end of September, I had a Sunday morning game. Um, when I was at the game, I jumped up and tore my ACL. So uh, terrible September, man. <laughs> like September. Oh my gosh. Like, yeah. So tore my ACL literally. So I'm like, wow, look, what, what else can happen, you know? And it's like, I got operated in November, but from 2001, I, 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 depressed, sad, PTSD, everything you want to call it, I was everything. Um, and I didn't care about anybody else but myself. I, I just turned into a different human being. And 
and, and what I did was nothing. I, I didn't do anything. I just kept going on my life. And, and I, I, don't, I don't know if I would be here if, if I didn't do something about it. So 2006, I went to my mom's house. Uh, and mind you, I was at Morgan Stanley making really, really, really good money at the time. Mm -hmm. um, like really good. And, and being part of the wealth division and you get perks because I know Latin and you know Spanish and everything. So besides that but i'm saying it's like some people wouldn't have left i had to leave if not i would have been dead i'm, I'm not kidding you maybe from a heart attack or nerves or um whatever it was uh, pills and stuff like that so um because they try to give me every pill you know you could possibly imagine um for anxiety and all that stuff so one time 2006 i went to my mom's like really early um about 9 a.m and i went there i lived in the city at the time and i went there and my mom, my mom's never changed the room since I left when I was 18 to go to college. And it was um, always the same, you know, same posters mm -hmm. and stuff like that, you know, like the U.S. national team. And I went there. She didn't hear me come up the stairs and she was literally crying and like, you know, praying on my bed, like literally bawling. And I thought something happened, like somebody died. Remember, this is 2006. And my, and my stepdad, I'm like, what's going on with mom? He's like, she's been doing that um, every day since 2001, um, you know, crying for her son to come back or, or get out of this thing. She didn't know PTSD either. No, you mm -hmm. don't know. But no, Snoop, we didn't ever think in a million years that this was going to happen. Um, and that right there, I said, wow, I'm, you know, I'm not just hurting myself. I'm hurting my friends, my family um, by just, to, to, you know, just, just being away from them and just being a different human being. So I needed to get help. Uh, so I talked to a lot of therapy and everything. And they said, you know, you really need to get out of the world for a you know, good six, 12 months. So what I did was I had an uncle, um, God rest his soul. He had a big, big, big acreage in Argentina. And he used to be a soccer coach as well too. Um, he had weights and stuff. So um, I went there for a year. Um, we meditated, we prayed a um, lot, read so many books, trained soccer every day. I was 40 pounds overweight and just, just leaving the world like on a sabbatical um, really, really changed my life because I came out of there a different person because um, I don't know if I would end up in a mental hospital or whatever, but it, 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 it could have, it couldn't continue the way I was going. It wasn't because I was doing drugs or anything. It's just my mind, I think, the nerves, man, it was so nerve. I was always like shaking and stuff and it, there's no reason. So that changed my life. 2007, I resigned from Morgan Stanley. They thought I was nuts, um, but they understood. I resigned 2006, just with, you know, give them a two weeks notice and flew out of here, flew out, flew out the States, uh, flew out of New York. I had to get out and it changed my life. I came back 2007. And from there is when I started, um, I went back to school study psychology, wanted really to know what happened with me. Um, and to this day, that changed my life, but there's still things that I deal with every day um, in terms of thinking about what happened. But now, now I accept it. This is who I am. This is what happened to me. So I'm just gonna accept it. And, and I have a way to deal with whatever comes my way. So yeah. that's, uh, yeah. There's a lot more, but I want to leave it at that. If you want to say something. Yeah. yeah. Well, what would you recommend for, I mean, obviously it's different. Everyone's story, everyone's journey is different. Correct. But you talked about, I accept it. I know I, you know, you, you face it basically and you own it yeah. effectively. But when someone's dealing with whether it's anxiety, I mean, now during COVID. Correct. More than ever in my life, at least I'm seeing anxiety, panic attacks on the, on the rise, like we've never seen before, right? Suicide rate jumping 300% over the last, you know, wow. 24 months. It, these stats are unbelievable, right? But wow. so much of it is, a lot of it's fear of the unknown, right? Correct. A lot, right. And, and, and what's going to happen. But there's other tools that people can use. And, and can you share some, I mean, that you've used that's yep. worked for you? And you've, you've named, you've talked a little bit about them, but can you just go kind of just, share specifics about what people can do that's worked for you that might help someone out there who's going through something similar right well first things i, I went to, to to the love 
love of soccer, which has been my whole thing. I went back to that. I went to, I was coaching, um, just keeping my, keeping, just keeping busy. And especially with something I love soccer, but the key is in the beginning, I didn't get help. It's okay to ask for help. I thought I was too macho, whatever. And, and, and thank God it's changed a little bit now, but with the, with the suicide rates, but there's so much help out there. Like you could just go on to a meeting, um, online you know what i mean there's so many apps and everything some are free you don't have to pay for them and and and, and it's you know you can even be anonymous and just share um you know i'm on i'm on all these private groups on facebook and and reddit and, and you literally just share and then you'll have all these people coming back and they don't even know who you are if you don't want to you know if you don't want to say who you are so there is help out there and and find something that you love so much and really focus on that and, and talk to people, like, don't be afraid to talk. I was afraid to talk. I didn't talk to anybody, Phil. We, we wouldn't be here right now. And just talking to you makes me feel better. Talking about it right this minute, right this second, has just changed my day. I, to be honest with you, I had a pretty tired day. I had a really bad, I didn't sleep well last night. I woke up breathing heavy and all that stuff. And that's just kind of normal. I accepted it. But you have a groggy day the next day. But now talking about it right this second, has just lifted up my enthusiastic as enthusiasm as I always am. And just talking to you as somebody that can listen, um, you know, they're, they're not out there for, for just to listen and say, Hey, who cares? So find somebody, find somebody that can, you can talk to without telling you what to do. Just, you need somebody to listen to you and say, Hey man, I'm having a hard time. This is crazy. This is what I'm feeling. And, and you can find that anywhere. Now I'm so blessed that you can find it anywhere. Uh, people complain, well, psychotherapy is so expensive. Well, there's free ones now. It's free. It's free. Uh, I'm blessed that uh, the World Trade Center Health Services has been so good to me. I'm part of the Survivors Network. I have free therapy for life. But even besides that, I um, go on to other groups. I talk to therapists. I talk to, you know, podcasts like yours. Um, and I continue to do soccer. And now... With soccer resilience um, and just like soccer, I give back to the worst day of my entire life. I turned it into a positive, you know? In the beginning, I didn't do that. I just said, hey, who cares? I almost died. We were listening to my friends. We were all messed up in the head because of what happened. Hey, let's just go out and party and then forget about it that way. But that never worked, obviously. You know, it, it backfired really, really hard. And just seek help there's nothing wrong with it i mean we're just we're just humans out there that need to talk to somebody before it gets really really bad um if i didn't if i didn't resign in 2006 i really really believe um i, I wouldn't be here i wouldn't be here married and have a little rescue dog i, I, I just it was just it was just um it wasn't me so now i am and just ask for help man please it's out there it's the, you can't say it's not it is out there there's apps there's groups uh especially zoom now with everything virtual and we could do it man and and, and and talk to me if you want to call me i mean we'll we'll let it out man we'll let it out and tell me what you're feeling you you know you want to beat the crap out of somebody whatever it is let's talk about it you know why is what's the reason what is that going to accomplish you know every time i'm in i get upset when i wake up or i think of bad things and it affects me for like a minute or two i'm like wait a minute I put my feet down, I'm safe um, wherever I am. And I say, okay, I'm here. So that's just a thought in my mind that's gonna go away the next minute. And that's one of the things I use. I, I plant my feet down. Um, well, my feet are always down, but I like put my, my hands on my knees and say, okay, my feet are on the ground. I'm okay. I'm not going to die at this moment. That the plane's not coming. Uh, to hit me wherever I am. I could be home, I could be in office or whatever. So please, there's so many, many different therapies that would be right for you and your individual circumstance that I promise you um, it will work. But please just ask, ask. As they say, ask and you shall receive. So please do that, please. You know, I think that's so helpful. I mean, even just talking to uh, my kids talking to other people's kids, the kids that I coach and just hearing about how anxious they are. And, and it always, it, I don't know why it surprises me so much, but boy, to hear about what they, they're, they're ashamed of these thoughts that they have of, you know, they're, yes, they're irrational. Yeah. 
Yes, they're not logical, but they're real thoughts, right? Yeah. right? And yeah. they're real issues and they're real things that if you just keep them in, it's going to eat you from the inside out, right? And and so what you just said, I think that hopefully that will help people hearing stories, hearing people talk about stories, you know, it hopefully will free people up to say, oh, I'm not alone. I'm not. And so the more people talk about it, the more, and it's not just to get a bunch of people talking about and making stuff up so they feel like they're part of the group. That's not what right, we're right. talking about. Exactly. Yeah, no, There's right, right. real, I've never, I've been fortunate enough to never, you know, at least in my adult years, never really deal with things. But when I was a kid, I had, you know, lots of thoughts. And not, fortunately, I, I shared everything because I just talked a lot. And my mom be like, well, that's kind of weird. But we we talk right. about it. And it was like, all right, it's gone now. But my, you know, my son is is more reserved and other kids are more reserved. And so they might not share as much. And so I just want to encourage you folks to to share, to to share with your parents, share with your friends, share with share with people and, and people you trust, right? right? To to find people that you know and trust that will protect the information and and not used against you too, right? Because that could obviously cause other issues. And so um I'm super encouraged by this. I know it's 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 just something that I get excited to see how you know, uh, God just works in people when, when we open ourselves to it, right? Because we can close ourselves off to everybody and everything. But I, I just look at it and with you and, and with, with people, um, you know, like yourself who, who have really escaped something that did take so many people. And it's so hard, but I look at it and go, Psalm 139 talks about God numbers our days, right? God knows the number of our days, knows the number of hairs on our head. I look at it and go, he's got a purpose for you. He's got a why. What? So with you, what, what do you see that? I mean, you look back and you go, okay, from 2001, 2006, it was just this blur and you Correct. weren't really living. Blur, you come yeah. out of that, you come and you use soccer, you use other things and, you, and you're able to share. Now, what would you say in 2022, as we're talking here, what, what is your personal why? Why do, you, why do you think God has you here and spared you in 2001 to be able to now help people and encourage people? But what is your why and life purpose at this point? And how does that play out in your life? That's a great question. Yeah, my why is to utilize my God-given gift, which is to, to not be shy, not, not be shy. Um, I, I don't mind being uncomfortable in situations. So that right there gives me... Uh, I guess a uh, little talent to, you know, be free, be, I guess an extrovert or whatever you want to call it, but to utilize soccer, to utilize soccer resilience, just live soccer um, to help kids, help parents. And my why is literally I wake up in the morning. What am I going to do today to help someone, even if it's by giving them a thumbs up on Facebook or just saying something because everybody's going through something and my why since um, 2006 has been to help individuals that are going through mental health issues. Um, and I use soccer because that's, that's what I know. Um, but there's so many other things that I do. I, I, I volunteer. Um, I, I put a lot of stuff on, on Facebook that are, or other social media that are uh, encouraging. And that is my why every day I wake up. What am I going to do today? why I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because I wouldn't be here if I didn't do something about it. So let's get out there. The world, now you can touch anyone because mm -hmm. of this social media and podcasts. And, and, and so that's my why. I want to just continue, continue to give because, um, you know, just the stories of kids these days, like, like you know, your son, they just keep it reserved in there. And, and and I've done that, and I blew up 2006 like it was just a disaster. It's a bomb, you know. So just to keep it hold it in there is is really bad. And I, I do it sometimes too now. Um, if I'm fighting my wife or whatever it is, I hold it in for weeks, and then we get into an argument, and it just blows up because I never told about it. But I've learned, even as as a husband, to talk to your wife and, and say, "Hey, um, that's soccer. That's how." you know, teamwork. We talk about things like she's my teamwork. I need to trust her. She's my teammate. And, and my, my goal is to be a good husband. Uh, hopefully down the road, we're praying about it for, for kids mm -hmm. and just continue doing what I'm doing and, and, and meeting individuals like yourself. Every day I try to meet somebody new like yourself, that's going to 
make an impact in my life. I mean, you do have already. I mean, just putting me on the show and your amazing uh, leadership and just everything about you is is is, is what I would like to uh, have a relationship with. So yeah, that's my why. That's encouraging. Thank you for those words. And you know, I know one of the other things that you're doing, and I know it's a big part of what you're doing lately, is. Uh, working with uh, the grassroots initiatives for youth soccer in New Jersey. Can you talk a little bit about that, some of those initiatives and, and how, you're, uh, how you're working with the youth? Yeah, so I grew up playing ODP, everything in New Jersey. So um, soccer in New Jersey, youth soccer was always there for me. Uh, but I, I just one day, it was a Sunday, um, like two years ago, I called, I sent an email to, to the executive director and I say, Hey, uh, listen, my, 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 my specialty is marketing or outreach. And if you ever need any help, let me know. So we, we got on the phone. I started volunteering for them. And then we, we get this grant from U.S. Soccer, which is uh, mainly to be used to help uh, underserved or just any clubs or, or any um, programs that need a little help, either by resources, education, or maybe some funds. And man, I was like, this is exactly what I want to do in my life and with soccer and be part of a governing body where I can learn. So, I, man, I, I'm blessed that I'm doing this because because I meet people every single day, if it's either through this or um, go to meet them at their fields and see all their needs and, you know, just see these coaches that put everything into it. And, 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 and you know, they, they sometimes get so disappointed because, even though they put everything into it, nothing really changes. You know, that's just the way life is. You know, it's not like, uh, um, you know, roses and stuff. So I help them. I help them here. We, we're, we're the governing body. I am here um, to help you. I'm, I'm the guy that's out there, the spokesperson for New Jersey Youth Soccer and talking to anyone that how we can help with all our resources and everything. And it's just been phenomenal. Absolutely I am absolutely blessed to, to be doing this. I met some some amazing human beings and listening to stories and sharing mine. And immediately, you know, you click because of soccer, but um, now I'm utilizing soccer again, but now with New Jersey Youth Soccer, which has opened up the doors to thousands of kids, thousands. Um, and, and yeah, it's just, it, it's every day. And that's what I'm doing for them. And I do a lot of other stuff with them too, but that is like my main t title, project consultant for uh, the Innovate to Grow grant. Uh, we're trying to, you know, make New Jersey the grassroots um, king of the United States, but then utilize that with other states as well too. So we're all connected through US yeah. So that's what we're doing. So, yep, been doing it almost a year and a half now. Um, just love it, yeah. And that's awesome. Yep. I, I just love the power of soccer. I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's not only played everywhere, but it's used. I mean, you've seen it with just live soccer and with your travels, you throw a ball on the field and it breaks down every barrier, right? right. It breaks down the walls. It breaks down the, all the different demographics, all these different debates and the hatred and the, you know, I mean, you see it in the game where they're, they're, kneeling and, and everything else to say we were saying no to racism but the reality is that i've seen around the world for the most part there will be racist people right but when you get on that field just let's play the game yeah dude right it, and it, you know that it's amazing thing in the world yeah it's just it's amazing. yeah unreal class differences you know race differences religion differences all these different things we just say matter. let's yeah. play yeah we, and, and everyone can kick a ball, right? Like, I mean, right. some people that are uncoordinated, some people this, but they can, you can still get out there and laugh and run and just, right. just have a good time. And, and I think through that, when we're intentional, we can do so much. We can teach so many lessons why we do this show, obviously, yeah. but it's also why I'm, I'm working with different orphanages, different people around the world to say, how can we use this tool to be able to build trust, to be able to build relationships, to be able to build into communities and to help these kids who don't have family to these kids who don't have the things that they need. How can we get them those things in the best way so that everyone can flourish, right? How can we create these environments, which is what you're doing in New Jersey and what we're trying to do and we're going to do around the world. How can we create these environments that allow everyone in them to flourish? 
right? As I say, bring a little shalom to the communities around us. What does that look like? And so I just love hearing just, you know, your heart, how you're taking, you know, and just saying, all right, we got this. Let's, let's work together to see how we can help these kids, not just be good soccer players. Cause most of these, I mean, that's the reality. Most of these kids won't play in college. Most of these kids won't go on to play. Most of these yep. kids probably won't even play when they're 15, 16, but right. they can learn lessons. They can use the rest of their life. If we see that as the priority and not right. making little messies to get back exactly. to your Argentinian roots um, out there, because that's unrealistic and it's going to burn kids out and it's going to freak kids out. And it's going to cause more anxiety for kids because they're going to have put these expectations on themselves. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I just, what do you think about that? Yeah, man, uh, just uh, I, going around, I see it all the time. They have these huge expectations. Um, um, you, you know, they give them this um, story of, 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 of success you know you do this you recruit and all this stuff and i really have a hard time thinking about that because it's about yeah teaching them the game but then teaching them what can they do when they're done playing the game um and it's not a league anymore it's just pick up soccer uh, because we have a huge issue where um there's a there's a there's a stoppage like when the kid turns 13 or 14 he either plays in high school or club or he doesn't play. So pretty much that stops them from playing soccer. So um, we need to teach these kids fundamentals about life and, 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 and um, disappointments and failure, not just go, 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 kick the ball, kick the ball. And we, the soccer has, has literally um, become that where your team's the best. We're going to have the best this. We're going to have the best this and that. And then it, there's a lot of disappointments out there. Every Sunday, every, every every day, there's disappointments from these kids that thought, hey, I thought I was going to make it and be a little messy and all that stuff. You know, I think it's crazy that they're doing this. And and I know why they're doing this, but I'm not going to get into a whole lot of the whole politics. <laughs> but it's literally nuts that, you know, um, you know, this is the way the game is. And I, I'm hoping if I can go out there and ha- help a couple of kids, help, help teams, in my daily um, outreach and talking to individuals that at least I'm, I'm doing my job, my part. Um, and yeah, it's just, uh, it's a little sad, you know, it really is to how, because the game, like you and I could get into a fight in the game while we're playing, but then after the game, we're cool. You know what right. I mean? You right. leave it the game, man. It's just the best sport in the world. Like it doesn't matter white, black, anything, any country you're playing against each other. And it's like, amazing amazing uh that's why the world cup's amazing and and, and you know all the leagues you play against are different different cultures different e- economic uh, reasons where they're at so yeah yeah um, yep. yeah when i lived in honduras i was just as you're talking yeah. about that i was just we're talking i'm just remembering i lived there for about yeah. seven weeks and i got to play with a, a team over the summer and immediately boom i'm buddies with these guys right like yeah. we're, we're hanging out we're you yeah, know yeah. now i will tell you I'm sure there were all kinds of slurs being yelled at me as the only white dude out there on the field. Right. Um, I know that there were, I know that they were speaking in Spanish. I knew enough Spanish to know that they weren't saying good job, go Phil. Um, but uh, you know, it was, it was fun and it was so great because the guys on my team, even the guys, like you said, on the other team after the game, it was, it was done right during the game. It's the juice of competition, but it was, it was a blast. And, and to be able to, cause those are guys I never would have, very unlikely that I would have talked with them. Cool. But one of the guys from the, the community that I, I oversaw there back in the day, uh, he played on the team. He's like, hey, come out and play with me. And I was like, yeah, of course, let's go play. And the fields sure. were just dirt. I mean, yeah, they yeah. were. I was afraid I was going to break an ankle every time I was out there. Yeah. But it didn't matter. And the balls right. were flat half the time. And the, the penalty played. spot was eight yards out instead of 12 and, you know, whatever. But it didn't matter. Right. So that, that's the beauty of it. I just think we can play and have fun and, and just yeah. hopefully learn to, that's why I'm hoping we can use this game more intentionally to learn to love better, learn to, to yeah. get along better, not just for the sake of getting along, but the sake of actually understanding people and knowing people and trusting people, because that's what we can, can do if we're intentional. And that, I mean, that's why we're doing this, this uh this program that you know coaching the bigger game i mean obviously the bigger game is not soccer um it's life and how can we really coach that through the game that we get to do so with that 
the last couple of questions we ask everybody. It's always a bittersweet feeling when we're kind of wrapping up these conversations, but we got to do it at some point, right? Yeah, exactly. yeah, of course we could. Of course we could. Sure. People might get bored at some point. Um, but yeah. what lessons uh, that you've learned directly from the game? And you talked a little bit about this earlier, but maybe you have something um, from the from the game of soccer. Have you used in your marriage, really? And and what what does that look like? Yeah. So after two thousand and six, uh, you know, when I when I, when I played before the nine eleven, I didn't think about uh, you know just thought about soccer winning and and, 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 you know, we had a great coach. We won the States in, in high school and, you know, the coach was amazing. I always thought, you know, we always thought he was a mean guy, but now I look back, it's like, wow, he was really teaching us life lessons. Like don't be late, uh, you know, be there on time, but, you know, don't, don't go out late, you know, make sure you, you stick to the diets that he's telling, just follow directions and of what your superior is telling you. That's one thing. Be humble humble because everybody's different everybody's on their own journey so just please be humble i'm you know i've learned that from the soccer game teamwork everybody's different everybody has their own position where they have their job to do and then when i'm in a in a teamwork environment for uh work or soccer resilience we each have our own little um like our own skills to to bring to the table and all of that I learned and it's helped me out in, in my marriage, it's helped me out in career wise um, and just being an everyday person of how to, in soccer helped me with literally everything. I Every time I, I do something, I think about oh, what do I do in the game, this, that. So it's always there. Um, and I'm blessed that I have that. And that's why I'm out there um, trying to teach that to um, individuals, coaches, uh, players, and anyone, you know, yeah. yeah. You know, and I, I have never said this on the show, but you were reminding me of it when you said ever, literally everything I do, it's helping me. And I just, I had a picture, of course, to flash through my head because I have random thoughts go through my head, but yeah. of how many, how many iPhones or phones or other things have you saved with your feet by dropping them? And you just have the instinct to, to save it with your feet. Right. I mean, that, that's another that thing. That's hilarious. Right? Yeah. <laughs> my, my wife gets mad at me because I, when stuff drops on the floor, remote control, whatever it is, I pick it up with my toes and my feet. You know what I mean? yeah. but I'm, it's not, it, it's just, I'm not lazy. I literally, I just got to bend down and grab yeah. it. But it takes so much longer. But to me, it's like a little competition. She's like, pick it up. What are you doing? So I'm like, wait, I almost got it. So yeah, dude, I've been doing that forever. It's just great. You brought that up. That's hilarious. I just did that yesterday. And she's like, get it up, pick it up. So I said, hold on, I almost got it. And you get it between the toes, you bring it up, and then you That's got right. it. Like, right, That's yeah. exactly right. That's exactly right. And for sure, I'd, yeah. I mean, why wouldn't you do that? I mean, so yeah. now you can tell her that you did it because you needed to talk about it on the podcast. I mean, this is, you know, it's, it's important. You gotta, gotta have, you gotta have, be able to have these conversations. She's learned a lot too from the game of just by being with me. We've been together eight years and she had no idea about soccer, but then she started to really realize the, the passion and everything that goes with it. And, and, and she came with me to a couple um, regional tournaments that I was uh, representing the state of New Jersey and, um, uh, she was just amazed of the passion, the fans and everything. And uh, she's learning little by little. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Love it. Love it. All right. So last question, what have you read, sure. listened to, or watched that has most impacted your thinking on how soccer explains life and leadership? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I read a lot. Uh, I don't read, I read books, but I read a lot of blogs, soccer and business leadership. Uh, I continue to read that because it keeps changing. Uh, you know, I had a hard time saying no to people. That was like my really bad weakness mm -hmm. just recently. And, and now I learned to say no, um, that's going to think that's going to take my time or thing. I really don't have time. And I've read that uh, some book or something. It was about soccer. And then the, they came back and said, you know, saying no is really hard. And I learned that that was one of the most important lessons I learned in the last year or two. And, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I watch documentaries of, 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 of now, you know, just everybody you can watch. And, and, and I just watch everything educational and I continue every day to try to educate myself uh, with people around me. Um, you know, cause if you're with smarter people than you, you know, you'll learn. And, and that's coming back to soccer because my brother's seven years older and I used to play with him and all my cousins that are seven years older too. And what does that do? It gives you the, 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 
the, the, you know, you need to be strong. They put you on the floor and it's just the people I was around made me a better player. And it's the same thing in life. The people that you're around, you want them to make you a better, a better person mm -hmm. and make sure you find those friends that are making you a better person and not bringing you down or not making fun of you. Yeah. Make fun of each other as, as friends, but nothing that's going to bring you down. You want somebody that's going to pick you up and challenge you. And um, that's my thing. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I actually just was on a different podcast. Um, if you guys want to check it out, it was the bear and the ball. It's the cow South podcast, but uh, Nick Webster um, yeah. was interviewing me. We talked about this very thing was the idea of if you are a leader and you're the smartest person in the room, and the smartest yeah. person on your leadership, you're probably not a great leader. You need to surround right. yourself with people smarter, better in that, you know, in different areas where you're not as good and right. you need to know what you know, you need to know what you don't know and surround yourself with those people who will be able to help you with what you don't know. Don't surround yourself with a bunch of yes men and women who, who just say, Oh, great job. Good job. But no, exactly. it's people who are going to be better than you. If someone comes on your team and they're better than you, celebrate that because that means yes. you're going to get better right? right don't get all bummed to go oh i'm not, not going to play now well if you're not good enough to play then if your team's going to get better with this other person then yeah that's what the team's all about right you want to be a better out. team right so that's something that i think is a great leadership lesson it's a great lesson in life too because yeah. you know you're going to be in jobs and you're going to think you're the you know big time and then all of a sudden some new hot shot's going to come in and right you know what are you going to do about it Exactly. Are you going to, are you going to be better? Are you going to improve? Are you going to, are you going to go, Oh man, uh, figures, they bring someone else. And no, that's not, hopefully no. it should inspire you to do things that you would never have been able to do without those people pushing you. So no, absolutely yeah, love you that. Know that. You know, don't get discouraged and say, all right, this is my time to, um, go up to his level and, and work harder, you yep. know, instead of being discouraged, Oh, I'm done. I don't, you know, that's not the way to do it. Like, like you just said. So yeah, absolutely. I'm all right yeah. well thanks again for being a part of this thanks for uh all that you're doing man i'm just so Thank grateful you. that we uh we did get to connect last month and we're, we're able wow. to have these conversations i can't wait to, to continue the conversation someday soon absolutely my brother can't wait to uh maybe after all this COVID or whatever we'll get together for a nice dinner or something yeah we'll we'll make it happen that'd sure. be great that'd be um, great all right folks well thanks again for uh being a part of this thank you for taking the time just to listen. And I, and I hope that you're learning right along with me, um, with, from, from David, all these other people, if you haven't gone back and listened to the other episodes, I encourage you to do so. We just did the, uh, recap from 2021, uh, with about 20 or so different clips. If you, that's a good little sampler platter. If you haven't already, uh, listened to, uh, to a lot of it, or even just as a reminder of these great episodes that we've been able to have. So I just want to, again, thank you. I want to, um, remind you about the coaching the bigger game program. Uh, we'll have that in the show notes, the warrior way program, as well as the Facebook group that you can be a part of. So thanks again. Uh, but as always, as we sign off, I just hope and pray that you are taking everything that you're learning from this show and you're using it to be a better leader, a better spouse, a better parent, a better friend. And you're also reminding yourself continually that soccer really does explain life and leadership. Thanks a lot. Have a great week. All right. Amen to that.